And it's my first time in Trieste. It was beautiful coming in this morning with the train and the sea. It was my fr it's my first time with Labora, and they tell me it's nothing today, so... <laughs> Anyway, as Dimitar just said, uh, we focus on, on trying to understand and dissect uh, tumor host interactions. And as I will try to convince you, chronic lymphocytic leukemia is a good tumor model where to, uh, uh, to perform these studies. Uh, probably you are very familiar with the disease, having Dimitar here, but just to remind you quickly, it is the most common leukemia in, in Europe and North America, and it is characterized by the chronic accumulation of a population of mature B cells. So diagnosis is extremely simple. You can see these mature looking cells on a, on a blood smear, and you just need three antibodies to make the diagnosis. They, they have B cell markers, and they also have CD5 on the cell surface. The interesting thing is that uh, be, uh, notwithstanding this very, very homogeneous presentation, the behavior of patients is very variable. So you can have patients that really just have lymphocytosis. This subset of patients, really a, a minority, will never get treated for the disease. And in, as you can see in the x-axis, these are years. So essentially, these patients won't have any kind of uh, uh, problem from the disease in terms of quantity or quality of life. On the other hand, you see this, kind, this subset of patients, and this is representing approximately a third. And of course, it really depends on the center of where you are, uh, where you're looking. And this subset of patients is totally different. So they will be, they will need treatment within the first year since diagnosis. They will respond initially to treatment, but become progressively resistant. These patients will die because of CLL, and these years, this is a few years, it won't be nice because they will be in and out of their hospitals, they will have a lot of complications because essentially they are immune deficient, so a lot of infections essentially. Now, the, the interesting thing for the hematologist in the feeds has always been how to make prognosis and diagnosis. So when you have a patient with this diagnosis, how can you, can you reassure him or her, or can you keep sort of a, of a, of a closer look because uh, he or she has got a, a more progressive disease? And the old way to do that has been to look molecule by molecule and gene by gene. And I put this, this uh, slide as sort of a... Uh, paradigmatic of one of the biggest conquests in the field and paradigmatic of what I, I call the old days. So the way this was done, this is almost 20 years ago, and it was published by, uh, by I, I think, a close friend of, of, of Dimitar, Nick Cerazzi. What they saw in that paper was that you could very effectively distinguish patients on the basis of the presence or absence of mutations in the immunoglobulin uh, V genes. And as you can see from Kaplan-Meier curves, this was the presence of unmutated V genes was associated with a much more aggressive um, clinical behavior. And beside immunoglobulin genes, there have been a surface molecules, surface markers. One of them was CD38, identified at the time. Other were uh, cytoplasmatic molecules such as up 70 integrins, and so on. And all these have contributed uh, in, the, in the years from the beginning of 2000 to 2010, something like that, to refine diagnosis for these patients. So that the typical CLL patients at that time was undergoing a, a, a study to detect mutations in the IGV genes and probably some more accurate immunophenotypic characterization. And then things changed rather completely uh, with the uh, advent of the uh, genomic revolution. So at the end of 2009-2010, uh, I was lucky to be part of a team of investigators, which uh, uh, was coordinated by uh, Riccardo La Favera in New York, who I, who I believe was here a few months ago, by uh, Gianluca Gaidano in Novara, and by uh, Robin Foy in Rome, where uh, uh, the idea was to uh, go and look not gene by gene or molecule by molecule, but on a more uh, uh, omic way. So to take a look at the exome of these patients, and in that effort, uh, we selected patients that were refractory to fludarabine, which is the most commonly used, or which was the most commonly used uh, chemotherapeutic agent. So these are the bad prognosis patients. And as you can see here, the, those studies identified a number of previously unrecognized mutated genes. 
we, we knew about TP53 before then, but we, we had no idea that BF3, which is in the pathway, in the NFKB pathway, or, or NOTCH1 could be uh, mutated in these patients. So that opened up a whole uh, new era for the, for the disease and a whole new uh, uh, possibilities in terms of thinking about the disease. And as we see it now, we know that there is a very complex pattern of genetic lesions. So there is no common underlying genetic lesions for these patients. Each patient has got a different history. And of course, we can group them according to the, to the most common or most represented genetic lesions. And here you have uh, uh, one example taken from a Nature paper by, by Dana Vilandao a couple of years ago. Um, as you can see, some of the, these lesions have got a hierarchy, and they are temporally spaced. So that there are early genetic lesions, and then as the tumor evolves, there are intermediate and late accumulating genetic lesions, and they are prognostically meaningful. So again, if you look at uh, either progression-free survival or overall survival, you can see that the presence of absence of a single genetic abnormality is making a, a lot of difference. The other point that we know now and that people are, are really paying attention to is that this disease is highly dynamic. As I told you a minute ago, there are early, intermediate, and late uh, genetic events in the disease. And this occur in part as a consequence of treatment. So there's, we, we put pressure on the clone by administering some very toxic drugs, and this pressure is uneven. It really depends on the, uh, on the quality of gen the, the genetic uh, lesions inside a tumor. So that what comes out, what emerges after therapy, is not necessarily what was there before therapy. However, as you can see, from the founder population to treatment, diagnosis occurs somewhere along this way, this tumor changed, so it acquired new colors, which are new genetic lesions, which were fixed in a subpopulation uh, of the tumor. And this is probably the result of environmental pressure. And this is why, this is one of the reasons why it is so important to study the microenvironment in this disease, because it really contributes to select uh, subclones inside a tumor and to stabilize them. So, we say that the microenvironment is important uh, for, a, for a number of reasons. One of them is that uh, CLL cells are really different according to the compartment where you study them. Uh, unfortunately, most of us, in, when, when, when studying the disease, have access to cells that come out uh, from the blood of patients. So we get uh, blood tubes and, and we purify these cells. So these cells are don't do much of anything. They don't proliferate a lot, and in a number of a few uh, hours to days, they tend to go into apoptosis. However, if you have the chance of getting cells from lymph node biopsies, which today are, are quite infrequent for, uh, for uh, they're not, not needed clinically anymore, you will see that you can find a number of cells within this environment that are actively proliferating. And there have been experiments using uh, the uterated water, so giving patients heavy water to drink to measure disease kinetics, that have concluded that up to 1% of the, clone, of the whole clone renovates daily. So essentially, we, we are looking at a sort of standby compartment, whereas the real action is probably taking place elsewhere. And this elsewhere is the leukemic niche where it is likely that this B cell can find its, an, its antigen, uh, adequately presented, and a number of accessory signals that can uh, promote uh, proliferation of a subset of cells, acquisition possibly of novel mutation, and evolution of the clone. And if you look at this niche, this is a typical lymph node uh, slide from a CLL patient. For those of you who are familiar with lymph nodes, this looks not, nothing like a normal lymph node. There are no more germinal centers. What you can see is that there are some paler areas here and here. They are called proliferation centers. If you looked at what's inside, you can see that there are leukemic cells. They are the green cells. And some of them are blue, which means that they are proliferating. They are stained by a proliferation marker. Many of them are surrounded by CD2 cells, and these, this, this was done with CD2 antibody, but they are also CD4, but they are essentially helper T cells. There are a number of macrophages, and there are endothelial cells. 
And all these interactions have been studied in details, and many of the players that at the molecular levels have been identified that sort of contribute to change the propensity of this cell to grow or to go into apoptosis. And there are bilateral exchanges going on between the, the, the different uh, cell types. The other reason why we, we, we believe that CLL is a microenvironment-dependent uh, disease is that if you try to grow these cells purified, you, you, you won't succeed. If you take, uh, if you purify CLL cells from the blood of a patient and you put them in culture, they're going to be dead in a matter of two or three days, something like that. However, if you culture peripheral blood uh, mononuclear cells, so if you include the myeloid cells and the T cells, and if you derive macrophages from these patients, they can exert some protective uh, effect. So you can keep your cells uh, for longer. And this is really both contact dependent and dependent also on soluble, uh, on soluble mediators. For this reason, CLL cell lines are very difficult to stabilize. There are some cell lines in, in, in uh, available. We have used some, but they all have EBV. And also, for these reasons, xenograph models have been very difficult. Dimitar mentioned that I, 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 spent, I was in, in Cornell. One of the ideas there was to make PDXs, so to take CLL cells from patients and to have them grow in uh, immunocompromised mice. That did not succeed. And the reason it did not succeed is, again, that if you put in purified CLL cells, they don't engraft. What you need to make the engraftment is to add activated T cells. So you need to take the blood from the patient, you need to stimulate the T cells overnight with a polyclonal signal, and then you inject everything into, into the mouse. And there what you see is engraftment in a, in a very high proportion of cases, over 80%, I would say, with the formation of spleen nodules where you really see that your leukemic cells are tightly interacting with the T cells, which are likely to be to, to produce some supporting factors. The, the, the downside is that in, uh, at a later stage, the T cells become alloreactive, so they recognize the, the, the mouse MHC, and so the, the mouse is dead by uh, graphers to zoast in a matter of four to five months, something like that. So all this knowledge on the disease has contributed to a dramatic revolution in terms of, uh, of therapy of this disease. Uh, I, I, again, when I, when I was in New York, I went to see the hematologist there, and I mentioned through Darabin, and he looked at me like I was from another planet, and he said, I haven't administered fludarabine to a single patient in five years. And I, I believe here it is still the standard of care, together with cyclophosphamide and, and anti-CD20 antibodies. The knowledge on the pathways that are oncogenic for these cells has contributed to identification of inhibitors of kinases, such as the bruton tyrosine kinase or PI3 kinase inhibitors in the therapy of the disease, and also in the interference with the anti-apoptotic mechanisms that are in place in, in the cell. So now a patient, maybe a lucky patient, can expect not to receive any kind of chemotherapy for the treatment of his or her disease. Uh, all of these are highly effective. So the great majority of patients respond, and responses are durable. Um, however, none of these drugs so far cure the disease. So apparently what is known from the studies where these, uh, these drugs have been discontinued is that there's, there must be a reservoir of the disease, even in the patients that show very good responses, so that when the drug is discontinued, the disease picks up again and very rapidly. And for these reasons, patients that are on BTK inhibitor therapy are advised not to discontinue the therapy, which also makes some kind of economic considerations for countries with different health systems, such as ours, because these therapies are highly expensive. So to think of treating someone for 10 years maybe, five years even, uh, with something that costs $150 per year is something that our national health system probably cannot afford. And it is also why research in the field is, is, all, is ongoing, also into the uh, ter alternative uh, uh, therapeutic approaches or complementary therapeutic approaches, maybe combination therapeutic approaches where you can come up with a drug that targets the oncogenic signaling and a drug that likely interferes with these pro-survival signals that come from the environment. So in this context, we've been interested in studying uh, 
uh, CLL interactions and with the surrounding environment. And I have to say that my first project and my first interest in CLL was because of this guy called CD38, which has become now one of the most successful uh, therapeutic targets in myeloma, by the way. Anyway, what I'm going to focus on today is the role of the uh, NOTCH uh, system uh, in this leukemia. Uh, we know from these genomic studies, and this is uh, the latest studies from, uh, from the Spanish group Elias Campo, that approximately 20% of CLL patients mm -hmm. have NOTCH1 mutations. It varies according to the uh, patients that are con uh, considered. Uh, of these, about 12, 11% have a clonal mutation, whereas about the other half had either a subclonal mutation or a, a mixture of different mutations in NOTCH1. And if you look at the gene, so here is the, the way these studies are done. People measure what are called variant allele frequency. And it, if you can see here that uh, there is a cutoff of 12%. The blue ones are considered clonal, and the yellow ones are considered subclonal. When you look at the genes, the NOTCH gene is huge, but the mutations really are clustered in two areas, essentially. One is the uh, so-called PEST domain, and the other one is more, more, more recently discovered are mutations in the 3' UTR portion of the gene. These mutations matter in terms of uh, prognosis for these patients. You can see here the uh, progression-free survival and the overall survival. It's still unclear whether clonal or subclonal makes a difference, but in terms of at least of treatment, both the clonal and subclonal perform significantly worse than the patients that are, are well-typed. So it's supposedly it's doing something there. Now, let me just remind you a little bit about the NOTCH system, which is very, very complex. It took me a long time to understand it. Uh, on the cell surface, we have a heterodimer, which is composed of an extracellular domain, which is very sticky. It's full of sugars, and this is one of the reasons why antibodies for flow cytometries really don't work. Attached to it, there is the notch intracellular domain, which is the transcription factor. So this is the domain that translocates to the nucleus, binds to a number of nuclear cofactors, and controls gene transcription. And the way the system is activated is dependent on a ligand. The ligand can be expressed on, on, on neighboring cells, even the same cell type. And the interaction with the ligand, which belongs to two families, the jagged family and the DLL family, starts a series of two proteolytic uh, uh, cleavages, which releases, which end up with a cleavage exerted by the gamma secretases, which releases the intracellular domain. The intracellular domain then translocates in the nucleus does its job, gets phosphorylated by CDK8, ubiquitinated, and degraded. Now, the mutations in CLL are a specific of, a pe of the PEST domain, as I, as I told you, which is the domain that is important for ubiquitination. So these mutations are considered to be mutations that impact on the stability of the molecule. So the predicted effect is that the molecule is going to stay in the nucleus for longer time, and so potentially the signaling pathway is going to be more active in these patients. So we approach the, uh, the question of what does this molecule do in, uh, in, in CLL. Actually, Francesca Ruga, who is the person that did all this work, um, by collecting a cohort of mutated and wild-type patients and comparing them. We tried to collect them as homogeneously as possible. This was a few years ago. It was 2012-13. We, we still didn't know about clonal and subclonal, so we just considered whether the mutation was there could be highlighted. Uh, and and we, we selected the patients for having the same kind of molecular markers, but with or without notch one mutations. And what we observed was that patients that had the mutation had signs of more constitutively more active notch signaling. So it was in agreement with the working hypothesis that when the mutation was there, the pathways was constitutively active. And these are two ways to look at it. We looked at genes that uh, are in the, in the are reporter for NOTCH1 activity, and also we looked biochemically. The biochemistry of NOTCH is tricky again, because many antibodies that are said to recognize specifically one domain or the other are not so specific. Anyway, 
this is an antibody is specific for the active part of notch and what you can see is that the mutant the mutated patients have got a lower band sometimes they've got both bands sometimes they've got mostly lower band which is consistent with the presence of a mutation in the heterozygous state so this is the mutated molecule that has a deletion in the pest domain and weights less what we observed there was that very rapidly this signal, this, this activate, uh, activated state of the notch pathway that we could register when we were looking at cells just out of the blood of patients was down-regulated. So here you can see, irrespectively of whether the patients were wild type or mutated, we could see that the signal was going down very, very rapidly in a matter of hours. And this was because NOT1 signaling constitutively needs the ligand, independently of whether the, the gene is mutated or not. In order to be activated, it needs to be uh, to interact with the ligand. And we could say this based on a number of observations. One of them, which is he represented here, was the uh, analysis of a, of a very... Um, particular subset of patients that we could get, I was telling you later before, we could get from a collaboration with a hematologist in Croatia. Uh, he had patients uh, for whom he had peripheral, a sample of peripheral blood, bone marrow and lymph node taken at the same time. And this was because of the requirements of a trial for a rituximab in, in Croatia, where they had to get these unique samples. And so we studied notch one expression and activation in these cells. And we could see that in the lymph node, where I told you before, supposedly everything takes place, we could see the highest levels of notch one pathway activation. And we could also detect high levels of expression of the notch one ligands by immunohistochemistry. So we try to mimic in, in, in vitro this kind of niche. I um, told you that you can derive macrophages from the blood of these patients. They are tumor-associated macrophages, type 2 macrophages. You can see here they are the big cells, round cells. And they nurture CLL cells. They are called nurse-like cells for these reasons. Now, when you, when you plate autologous CLL cells from these patients on top of these big macrophages, what we could see was that when the, the patient had a mutation in the notch one pathway, we could see activation, nuclear activation of the notch one signaling. So that means that the, 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 the NICD is likely acting as a transcription factor. And we could also see transcription of notch dependent genes. What was this doing? It was, in our, in our hands, exerting a protective effect. So we did a number of experiments where we used the fludarabine. We, we, we come from old Europe. So we, we treated the cells uh, with the mutation in the presence of this layer that was activating notch one. And we could see that these cells were becoming resistant to the action of the chemotherapy. And we could win this resistance by using inhibitors of the notch signaling pathway, which essentially are gamma secretase inhibitors. So so you, you inhibit the cleavage that is responsible for the release of, uh, of the NICD. At the point, we started collaborating uh, with Walter Gattei from the Centro di Riferimento Oncologico in Aviano. And Walter had noticed that, uh, Walter and other investigators, this is the German group, have noticed that uh, CLL patients with notch one mutations treated with uh, rituximal, with anti CD20 antibodies, uh, failed to respond or were responding suboptimally. And so he had this idea that somehow CD20 should be should have been connected with notch one. And actually he showed that by looking at the expression of CD20 in a cohort of notch one mutated and notch one, and notch one wild type patients. And as you can see, he, he detected significantly lower levels. And so we started thinking together as to how this, uh, this could be possible. You can see that if you block, again, with the gamma secretase inhibitors, the notch one pathway, you recover CD20 expression. And at that point, this was 2015, we elaborated the first model, which we don't believe is true uh, in, in full details anymore, but which was the, the starting point for, the, for our subsequent work, where we thought that maybe the presence of the mutated notch was altering a very complex uh, nuclear circuit. Because you know that when uh, the NICD gets into the nucleus, it needs to bind uh, RBPJ, 
but NICD is not the only ligand for RBPJ. So we figured that if there was a mutation, there could be a competition between the NICD and likely histone deacetylases for RBPJ, which is a common uh, binding element for both. And I will, this is complex, I will get back to this later because as I told you, we have a sort of a further version of, of this model. In any way, we, we demonstrated there that the different levels of CD20 were dependent on a different activity of the histone deacetylases in mutated versus wild type uh, Notch1 samples. Now, the open questions are remain what is exactly the role of Notch1 in this disease because essentially what we did was a correlative study comparing Notch1 mutated and wild type patients, but we didn't get any real proof of the function of the molecule. And what, what, is the, what are the mechanisms promoting Notch activation? And more importantly, what is the advantage conferred by the pest domain mutations? So in order to answer the, this question, we figured that we uh, needed to have good models. And that was not that easy because uh, each patient has got his or her own degree of activation of the Notch1 pathway, his or her own variant allele frequency, so expression of the Notch1 mutation. And so we figured that we needed a cell line model. And we used this cell line, which is nothing like CLL. These cells grow very well. However, they are called CLL-like. What was important to us was the notch one here was in a wild type state. And we, we figured we wanted to make it mutated. And the way we wanted to do that was by, by uh, modifying the genome of the cell, modifying the, notch, the endogenous notch one gene. Because what we had noticed when working with the CD20 experiments was that the level of notch one in the cell, of the active NICD, was making a big difference. So that if you just pour in your cell loads of an ICD, you, you don't really get the, the real signature. You don't get the, 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 the true signal. And that is probably because you alter too much the nuclear balances. And so in order to do that, Francesca started working with the zinc fingers. I don't know if any of you has ever worked with zinc fingers. It took us one year to figure out they don't work, essentially. Or maybe we're not good enough to make them work. So then the CRISPR-Cas technology uh, uh, came about, and we used that to modify the genome of these cells. So we used two approaches. One side, we transfected the cells with Cas9 with a guide to exon 2 of the gene, and that was to make a knockout cell. So we, did, we caused a, a stop code on, in, the, in the second exon, and you don't get notch one on um, anymore, and we select almost like cell lines. And then we again exploited the non-homologous and joining uh, mechanism to generate a stop codon on exon 34. So we directed the enzyme to exon 34. We generated a stop codon, which is fairly similar uh, in length uh, to, the, to the physiological mutation appearing in, in patients. And to have a confirmation of what we were seeing, we used knockout cells and we infected these cells with a construct that encoded the wild type or the mutant NICD. And, and we started studying these cells. The reason for this was that what we observed and what I will show you later is that the, the best domain mu uh, mutation re still requires the activation of the ligand in order to function. So when you look at the cell line in vitro, you would need to have continuous supply of the ligand in order to see the system activated. Whereas here, you just infect with a virus that encodes the active portion of Notch1, so you, you get a ligand-independent system. So the first thing that we uh, wanted to do, so here is Notch1 wild type, here are the knockout cells, and here are the cells that get reconstituted with the different NICDs. You can see that there's a multitude of bands. They are all apparently Notch isoforms. They can be immunoprecipitated with Notch antibodies. We try to determine whether they are phosphorylated in tyrosine, in serine, and we try to, to think about several uh, modifications and couldn't detect anything They might be glycolytic differences. Um, in any case, what was critical to our experiments was that we needed to express Notch1, the, the, this construct, at the same level. And so we 
uh, uh, figure out a way to infect the cells and then to wait until the levels were equal and then to perform the experiments. And here you see that we obtained comparable levels of notch one and what we observed was that under these conditions we could get a slight increase in the transcription of notch one dependent genes signifying that the mutated version of the, of the molecule was actually doing its job. So then we exploited RNA sequences to get, a, to get an idea of what was going on inside these cells. The first result that was kind of reassuring at that point was that by comparing the wild type cells and the, and the knockout clones, we could see that the knockout clones had a globally down-regulating notch one pathway. So we were sort of on the right track. This was kind of an expected result. What we then saw was that we could detect downregulation of genes pertaining to chemotaxis and proliferation in the, knock in the knockout cells. So that these two biological processes appeared as the dominant signer, a signature of these cells. The other process that's important and that I will get back to is a regulation of the MAC kinases. So then with this in mind, we went back to our clones and we performed the functional validation of these experiments. And we saw that these knockout cells tend to grow less, particularly if you stress them, if you, for example, decrease the serum concentration. And that when you reconstitute them, you can overcome this growth disadvantage in a dose proportional to the presence or not of the mutation. The other thing that we observed was that the knockout cells could not migrate very efficiently in response to CCL19 chemokine, and this was again reconstituted by transfection of the wild type and even more of the mutant construct. This was due to the fade response of knockout cells to CCL19 was likely due to severely compromised expression of its uh, receptor, the CCR7 receptor which then compromise the ability of the cells to respond to the chemokine. You see here that CCL19 induces activation of the MAP kinases and importantly, activation of STAT3. This is completely lost in the knockout cells and it's partly recovered both in the wild type and in the mutant cells. Now, why is this? I will try to make a long story short and we'll go to the conclusion. We believe that this is because there is a differential regulator of this gene, which is called DAS22, and which is a negative regulator of the MAP kinases. So essentially, what we believe is that the, the, the absence of NOTCH1 induces upregulation of this negative regulator of the MAP kinases, and uh, this impairs uh, chemotactic responses and growth. <coughs> As you can see here, this is the expression of the DAS22 molecule in the wild type cells, in the knockout cells, and in the reconstituted cells. And you can see the knockout cells are the ones that have by far the highest levels of DAS22. DAS22 is a, is a tumor suppressor. It has been described as uh, uh, expressed by different kinds of, of tumors, and it's uh, uh, connected both to downregulation of uh, phosphorylation of the MAP kinases and also downregulation of STAT3. Importantly, STAT3 directly controls the expression of the CCR7 receptor, and so this uh, overexpression of this could explain our results of fade CCR7 expression and fade chemotaxis. We validated these results essentially by doing two things. We uh, first uh, 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 overexpressed uh, DAS22 in the wild type cells. And when we overexpressed uh, the molecule, STAT3 phosphorylation decreased, CCR7 expression decreased, migration decreased. On the contrary, we took the knockout cells and we silenced DAS22, <coughs> and what happened was that STAT3 phosphorylation increased, CCR7 uh, expression increased, migration increased. So this was a, a kind of a validation of the hypothesis, and then we asked why was that? And the answer lies in the epigenetic regulation of this gene. So what we observed was that the ratio between the methylated and unmethylated uh, promoter of this gene was altered in the knockout cells. So the knockout cells had more DAS22 because the promoter was less methylated. And we validated this by using a demethylating agent. This is uh, azacitidine. Uh, so essentially, you decrease uh, the uh, methylation, you increase the expression of DAS22, and then you decrease, again, CCR7 and chemotaxis, as well as responses to uh, 
DAS22. So this is the model. This is the evolution of the model that was in, in the other slides. We think that there is a competition that RBPJ is sort of uh, uh, the needle of the scale, I would say, in Italy. So it can shift, it can bind both the NICD and HDAC. In a situation when there is no NICD, HDAC and RBPJ are bound. And in this situation, the other, the, the methylating enzyme, the DNA methyl transferase 3A, is, it cannot bind HDAC and it becomes unstable. Whereas when we have DNICD, the HDAC gets displaced, it goes and binds DNA T3A, stabilizes it, and they become active in methylating gene promoters and in suppressing expression. This was validated uh, by uh, immunoprecipitation and, and uh, chip analysis. So by immunoprecipitating DNMT3A, we show that the amount of HDAC was significantly decreased in the knockout cells. And, and we also show that the DNMT3A was bound to the promoter in the wild-type cells and in the cells that were reconstituted with the wild-type and mutated NICD, but significantly less in the, in the, in the knockout cells. Now, this is all very well in a cell line that is, as I told you, very CLL-unlike. At this point, we asked what was going on in patients. And we were lucky enough that we were in the United States. There, were, there, there, were, there was a primary CLL center, so the clinicians there were seeing a lot of patients, and many of these patients were in poor conditions. So many of them had got notch one mutations. We could put together a cohort of a hundred, more than 100 uh, patients with notch mutations, and then we performed our quantitative analysis to determine whether the mutation was clonal or subclonal using the cutoff of the Nature paper that I showed you before. What we observed was that there was a negative correlation between the expression level of the, the, the tumor suppressor gene and the presence of the uh, 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 and the clonality of the mutations. And here you can see that normal B cells have got the same amount of DAS22 as the patients that have the mutation at the subclonal levels, whereas the patients that have a clonal mutations have got significantly decreased levels of DAS22. And in, if, you, if, you, if you study DAS22 expression in, uh, according to other clinical and molecular markers, you can see that it's always the patients that have the worst prognosi prognostic markers uh, that express the low, lowest levels of DAS22. They, the, those that lack uh, mutations in the IgV genes, those that have a more advanced uh, uh, disease stage, and those that got treated. Then we looked at some patient stories, patient by patient. Uh, this one is, I think, the most interesting. Here you see on the same graph the representation of the allele frequency, so the representation of natural mutation and the expression of DAS22. And for example, if you look at this patient, this patient had a subclonal mutation in May 2014 and had very high levels of DAS22. Then he, he or, I think it's a he, progressed in May, in February 2015 and again in January 2016, and concomitantly, the levels of DAS22 uh, fell in his uh, leukemic cells. And the same was true for other few patients that we could study at, uh, on a dynamic level. Now, again, also in patients, it appears to be a problem of methylation of the promoter, because if you look, patients that have high DAS22 expression have got a lower level of methylation of the promoter, and there's, again, an inverse, an inverse correlation. What is more interesting to us is that patients that have low expression of the tumor suppressor have got a constitutively higher phosphorylation of ZAP3, uh, STAT3, uh, have got a higher expression of CCR7, and ultimately have cells that migrate more, that move better. So, but let's, let's look back to our original model. We wanted to create a cell line that had the mutation in, incorporated in its uh, genome. And this is a cell line, and as I told you, when you study it from a, from, from, when you take cells that are in the culture, you don't see any kind of difference. You see that the notch one expression levels uh, are the same, and you see the genes that are involved in them, that, that are under the control of notch one, are not differentially expressed between the knockout and the mutated. However, 
If you culture these cells on a layer of cells that express the ligands, both jagged one and DLL1, you can see that cells that have the mutations display activation in as uh, much the same way that we could see in patients. So you get the two bands. These are, uh, again, heterozygous mutations. And what is more interesting is that this activation persists for longer time. So it proves the working hypothesis that the mutation impacts on the stability of the molecule inside the nucleus. This is a cleaved notch. So the way you do this experiment, you co-culture the cells on the ligand, and then you remove them from the ligand, and you chase them over time, three hours, eight hours, 24 hours. When you do this with wild-type cells, after three hours, in the absence of the ligand, activation is almost all gone. When you do it with a mutation, you can still detect an activated band, even dimly, at 24 hours. And when you look at the expression of the reporter gene, you can see that it's significantly higher in the pest domain, in the pest mutated cells, and it again stays higher for longer time. Our hypothesis is true also in this context in terms of uh, expression of, of DAS22 and again expression of the CCR7 gene. Now, this is important because it is reported in the literature that there is a crosstalk between mice and men in terms of notch ligands, so that human notch 1 can be activated by mouse uh, jagged 1 or DLL1. And so we figured that using these cells in culture was a complication, but maybe we could use them in mice. And so what we did was inject these cells into immunocompromised mice and see what was happening. And what we know, this has been done many times with MEK1 cells, what we know is that for some reasons, these cells home to the, or anyway home, proliferate very nicely in the kidney, and then they diffuse so that if you inject about 250,000 cells at day zero, by day 25, your mouse will have significant kidney disease, and then you will find metastasis in the liver, in the bone marrow, and to a lesser extent uh, to the lungs. And this was what we saw with the wild type cells. These are the kidneys at three weeks. You can see that they are almost completely inv invaded. You can see that there are some liver mats, and you can see that the rest of the abdominal organs, the spleen, is fine. When you inject the knockout cells, so the knockout cells would be the cells that have the highest levels of the tumor suppressor, the lowest levels of the CCR7 expression, and are the cells that grow less and, and, and migrate less. And these cells essentially stay there. So they are in the kidneys. There is disease in the kidneys, significant disease. We cannot detect no metastasis in the liver or anywhere else in the abdominal cavity. The most interesting result was with the mutant cells, because the mutant cells had limited disease. It was measurable. It was there, but it was limited in the kidney. You can see the weight of the kidneys, which is an indirect representation of the amount of disease. But what they had was a massive spleen. All, the, all of these cells were going to the spleen. You can see the difference in size, and it was very reproducible with various clones and so on. And when we looked for disease, of course, yes, you can see that here there's more disease. The interesting thing was that these mice also had disease to the brain. And the reason why we thought of the brain that we hadn't thought before was because we read a, a, a paper by Yanis Aifantis, who uh, is a notch one guru. He's, uh, he's also in New York. And uh, he published a paper saying that notch one mutations in acute lymphoblastic leukemia predispose to localization of the disease to the brain. And so we thought that maybe we could take a look and we could see that almost all mice had got significant disease to the brain, which was asymptomatic, at least from what we could, uh, we could detect. And of course, what we could detect was a constitutive activation of, uh, of the notch one signaling pathways in cells that were straight out, straight out of the mice, which significantly decreased dust 22 levels, signifying that, these, that the notch one pathways were, was active. So these are the take-home messages. Uh, we have association of notch one with the gene signature of proliferation and chemotaxis, and what we believe is that this mutation impacts on a complex nuclear balance that includes RBPJ as sort of a turning point, and then the HDAX and the DNA methyltransferase 3A. And the, what, what ultimately happens is that we alter the ability of DNMT3A to stabilize, bind its consensus sequences, and methylate gene promoter.
So this is the, the model. This would be a wild type cells. You have the right amount of NICD, and you have, and, and this turns in a, in a fine tuning of gene expression. When you come in with a mutant notch one, you alter you alter this balance. There's significantly more NICD. And that means if the HDAC is displaced from RBPJ, and all the HDAC1 can stabilize, can bind and stabilize the NMN33A, the result is that this gene target, which is called DAS22, is heavily methylated, and this results in a compromised protein expression. When the protein is not there, you have significantly more constitutive phosphorylation of STAT3, which can then activate one of its targets, which is CCR7, and this results in a degree of CCL-driven chemotaxis, where you have almost no movement in knockout cells to maximal movement in mutated cells. If we imagine this in a patient, this might mean that patients that have a mutating notch one clone can home better to those privileged lympho niches that I showed you in, in the beginning, where they find the antigen and where they find co-stimulatory signals. Now, where are we going now? Uh, I told you that it's... Uh, uh, the, the interest of what is really trending now is the issue of clonal evolution, of the different, how the different subclones uh, contribute to the uh, evolution of disease, both under sort of steady state condition and also uh, at the face of the uh, pressure deriving from therapy. So what we want to ask is whether we can uh, study clonal evolution in a plate. This is, the, uh, this is Simona. She was recruited last year to do this part of the project. And what she did was, the first thing she did was uh, uh, to, to color these two cells, the wild type and the pest, which are really our comparisons, to make them uh, both red and green. And what she's doing now is to try to culture them under different uh, conditions and under different environmental pressure and to see whether there is one subclone that becomes dominant over the other. She has done a few preliminary experiments, and what we see simply by culturing on ligand expressing cells, and what is interesting but still very much to be confirmed is that we get a significant advantage of the pest, uh, of the cells with the pest domain mutation over the wild type cells uh, in a period, of, over a period of a week, more or less. And this, you, you see the activation of the NOSH1 dependent pathway, which can be effectively shut down by the NOSH inhibitors. Now, when you go in mice, so when you mix these two cells, you put them in, a, in, in animals, again, you confirm that the cells that are in the spleen are almost exclusively the mutated cells, whereas you don't see spleen, cells in the spleen when you use the wild-type cells. So I started by saying that this was an idea that this project started to see whether there was some way of combining drugs to be frank, I'm, I'm not considered an, an optimistic person, so maybe it's because I'm a pessimist. To be frank, I don't think that there is a future for notch-based therapies in CLS, simply because, as we were discussing with Demeter, there's too much offer at present for this disease. So there are very effective drugs, and there are many drugs, so that if you have a patient that fails one, you still have a couple of options. So I'm not sure that there's anyone that would like to invest on this and to do the clinical trials and so on. However, uh, a significant fraction of patients, by significance I mean, I mean 10 to 12 percent of patients, over the course of their disease will uh, uh, get a transformation of the leukemia into a diffuse large B cell lymphoma. And that is a critical event, because then the, the therapeutic options are far more limited and clinical responses are really reduced. So when a patient experiences this, which is called Richter uh, transformation or Richter syndrome, it's almost in, uh, invariably a, a fatal complication of, of the disease. What is interesting is that about a third of these patients have got notch one mutations. And you can see that there is a progression in the representation of the mutations with the severity of the disease. So maybe this can be a, a, a good model where to study uh, NOTCH1 effect and, and most importantly where to determine whether inhibiting the NOTCH1 pathway uh, can be therapeutically uh, meaningful. Last, so I already introduced you to the two uh, girls that did the job. One is here and the other one is uh, here. She's a more recent uh, uh, adjunta, then we have Branimir who went back to Croatia, to Zagabria. Uh, 
uh, and uh, the, all the RNA sequencing data were done in, in, uh, by Salvatore Oliviero and Roberto Piva helped us with the uh, Cas9 experiments um, and uh, Gianluca Gaidano and Davide Rossi are very long, uh, long time collaborators. Uh, they provide us with uh, patient samples together with uh, Rick Furman uh, in Cornell. And thank you for your attention. Thank you.